Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Barb Kello, and I'm going to be your moderator for the webinar today. I'm a group director at InfoTrends, and I'm glad you could join us to build your understanding of when security counts. You know, with the incidents of fraud, identity theft, and counterfeiting on the rise, it's more important than ever to protect all kinds of documents against unauthorized reproduction and misuse. Producing those sensitive documents demands the highest level of quality and security. And this extends beyond checks to include applications like tickets, passports, ID badges, prescription pads, high-value coupons, cross-border documents, birth certificates, and more. I'm delighted today to have John Sweeney from uh, Content Critical and Mike Lambert from Safest Innovation joining me to spend some time talking to you about the importance of security measures. And what we'll be doing today is we'll be talking about um, a number of different areas, including secure printing applications across a number of different market segments, ranging from government to healthcare to education, technologies that people are leveraging, and we'll wrap up with some recommendations for peers in the industry. Before I get started, what I would like to do is make sure that we cover a few tips to ensure that you enjoy the webinar. First of all, if you're having technical difficulties, let us know by using the Q&A box, or you can troubleshoot by clicking the Help widget below. If you've got a question, and we'll be taking questions throughout the webinar, all you have to do is submit them via the, via the Q&A box. Make sure that you disable pop-up blockers. And if you want to see what the console can do, merely click on the Tips for Attendees widget for a complete rundown. Now, as I indicated, I'm going to spend just a few minutes up front framing the market and talking about what people are doing to protect against counterfeiting, fraud, and unauthorized reproduction. And then what you're going to hear are some good pieces of advice from what I categorize as two very good practitioners. John Slaney, the COO of Content Critical, and Mike Lambert, VP of Sales for Safest Innovation. We'll wrap up with some recommendations and conclusions. And again, please key in questions throughout the webinar. We'll be taking them as we get them in. Now, let's start by talking just a little bit about fraud, counterfeiting, and unauthorized reproduction. First of all, fraud is a pervasive problem. Believe it or not, 5% of revenues in the U.S. were lost to fraud. It's a $725 billion problem in the U.S. Now, for comparison's sake, look at the defense budget spending, which is about $650 billion in 2010. What we're doing is we're losing more money to fraud than we're spending on defense. And if you look at the cost of fraud, it equates to $2,200 for every man, woman, and child in America. The number of U.S. identity fraud victims rose 12% to 11.1 million adults last year. And that's the highest level since the survey uh, from Javelin Strategy and Research was initiated. I tell folks a couple weeks ago, um, I had my first experience with identity theft. My mother had passed away several years ago, and all of a sudden, I got a Citibank credit card bill in her name. And it wasn't an easy process to sit down and work through that. When we talk about fraud and secure documents, it's a lot more than checks. They cut across all market segments. In the financial world, it can be stocks, bonds, money orders, uh, in the insurance market, proof of insurance, claims approval forms. In the retail market, it can be gift certificates, cash register receipts. So it cuts across all industries and a number of documents. Now, the next question is, how are those documents attacked? Well, first of all, what you're seeing are four major mechanisms for really attacking those documents. The first is theft, and that's the acquisition of an original document with intent to present false information. In the case of credentials, um, it could be something like a credit card. But in most cases, document theft also entails the presentation of false information on an item. Uh, uh, when a bank blank check is stolen, filled in, and submitted for payment. The next major area is alteration, and that's the addition, removal, or otherwise change to the original information on an item. Um, and what it means is that the information presented has been changed. The most common uh, forms of alteration involve uh, ink or toner removal, 
and replacement with false information. We're seeing false issuance as an issue. And basically what's happened is that can be perpetrated by a trusted insider. That could be something like embezzlement. Or it can be perpetrated by someone outside, and that's usually via misrepresentation. And last but not least, we see counterfeiting or mimics. And those describe representations of an original item, often carrying falsified information. A mimic could be a color copy, uh, as an example, when currency is copied and presented as authentic. Or it could be a counterfeit driver's license, passport, or check. Now, the big thing is that document security is both an opportunity for service providers um, to gain new revenues um, from a number of different mechanisms for protecting those secure documents, and it's also big business for you. Um, and what you do when you look at document security is you are going to offer tools or features that are easy to recognize yet difficult to produce or reproduce um, so that the viewer understands what they are. Um, there are features that reveal attempts to alter original information, and there are features to educate acceptors on how to authenticate the actual information. And the example on the screen uh, is of a passport, which contains multiple different document features uh, that ensure that that document is, in fact, secure. Now, when we look at preventing theft, um, one of the keys is to control access to original items and employ tools that quickly identify if or when that theft has occurred. Um, what we see in the print side of the market are a number of options, things like control numbers, so that I can detect if a document, a document out, of, out of sequence is in fact missing. I can track that. I can also put security tapes and seals on boxes. Um, but those on-document technologies like control numbers and document IDs are absolutely critical when you look at the theft side of the market. Uh, the next thing is protecting alteration. And the key is to complicate the removal of original information and employ tools that quickly identify if and when that alteration has occurred. Uh, people are using things like chemical stains, toner anchorage, specialty inks, or erasable ink backgrounds. Now, and I know you're going to hear uh, John Slaney talk a bit about this, but the other piece is pre prevention of false issu issuance. What we're seeing is outsourcing providers or uh, enterprises uh, offer a whole different level of security for some documentation, both, by the way, printed and electronic. And what they're doing is they're constructing facilities that are fire retardant. They may have concrete, block, and steel, or they're surrounded by security fences. And they're equipped with things like fire suppression systems, motion detectors, smoke and heat sensors. They've got swipe card access, as well as exterior and interior surveillance cameras. And that's really to protect those documents against theft. And last but not least, you want to avoid counterfeiting or mimics. And what you want to do is employ tools that enable a reviewer to ascertain the actual legitimacy of the item and the information on it. And you want to educate them, the reviewer, relative to how to use those tools. Uh, they include everything like void panograms, panographs, microprinting, prismatic printing, a number of major tools that are available in the marketplace today. And I think the big message in all of this is that as a service provider, you have the ability to truly take a bite out of crime and support fraud reduction. And what you want to look at is how you can respond. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn over to John Slaney, and John's going to talk to you about what Content Critical does to help in terms of fraud prevention and in terms of making sure that their customers' documents are, in fact, secure. John, take it away. Thank you, Barb. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Content Critical, let me just give you a little history of Content Critical. Content Critical is a leading supplier of mission critical business communications uh, focused on custom solutions around customers' applications to provide secure processing platforms for the rendering of documents. We've, we service the Fortune 500 client base, and we've focused on 
customer service, and flexible solutions adapting many of our customers' needs and business requirements into our secure environment to ensure that those documents are read, render, redder, rendered uh, accurately and securely. Uh, did we get uh, on sync here? I'll get, I'll get you taken care of here, Jack. Okay. There you go. Flipping back. Uh, you should it. be fine, Jack. There you go. Okay. Sorry about that. Keep jumping back, Barb. I'm sorry. Uh, why don't I? I'll, I'll, move, I'll move this slide for you, for Great, you, Jack. Thank you. Some content critical, diversified communication resource offering digital print in a cut sheet and continuous formats, full color, monochromatic, monochromatic and micro. Uh, we also provide large format, full documents, uh, services, offset printing as well as rendering, fulfillment, mailing, intelligent inserting, and a full bindery and finishing department. As well as the uh, facilities for production, we also provide on staff programming development and web development that are tied into our products and services. John, just a quick question for you. Um, how many employees does Content Critical have? Content Critical has uh, about 150 employees uh, between multiple facilities, uh, between shop workers, uh, as well as uh, customer service management and uh, the developers. Great. Thanks, John. And moving down, uh, transactional, transactional document services, we offer the full scope of the document lifecycle from the creation through the information management, the production, the channel, multi-channel distribution, and then the archiving and distribution uh, through an e-based environment. All of these various different components incorporate various modes of security to render those documents to ensure that the, there is no fraud, there is no capture of critical information. And even in today's world, we talk about checks uh, and other types of documents, but it's names and addresses today that can be captured and can be uh, exposed to the privacy concerns for, for customers, especially when you're dealing with banks, financial institutions, and some of the larger customers. It's not just direct mail anymore. Uh, this information can lead to fraud in various different ways. What we're going to focus on is the microprinting. Content Critical delivers check processing for our customers. Uh, we utilize the OSA Digital 6160 platform for printing. Micro is, is a magnetic imaging character recognition, meaning that it's the magnetic toner that is being interpreted by the financial institutions to read that information with a higher level of frequency so that the error rates are reduced. Uh, check volumes have decreased with the ongoing uh, ACH transfer that's involved, but it's still a required vehicle of fund distribution for many financial service companies. Barbara, are we alive? Is that up to date? I just we're good. Okay. You good? Good. What we look at from a security perspective is three, three aspects. First is the uh, data side of security, the physical side of security, and then the actual personnel who are involved in rendering these documents. From a data security perspective, layered best practices are, are leveraged to secure, to provide multi-tiered uh, security traps to ensure that Intrusion is not part of your operation. Antivirus, anti-spam protection are required. Secure methods of trans transfer, SFTP, PGP encryption are a requirement, uh, both either receiving data through the Internet or through direct line transmission. When the data is received and decrypted and processed, it then also is put into a uh, what they call a at-rest, encrypted at-rest position, and then when complete, it's wiped clean from storage devices to remove it and remove the exposure of the institution or the, the company uh, from having that data reside on your servers. Management so is I critical. Gotta, yep. I, I, I got a, just a real quick question. I, you know, you mentioned if, when you look at the requirements, 
what vertical markets do you serve? And you've got obviously some very comprehensive data security practices. Uh, are there vertical segments where the requirements are more stringent than others relative to your business models? Well, we saw a, a number of years ago the financial institutions were very stringent on their requirements, but that has breached in, into, reached into healthcare with the HIPAA regulations, uh, and, and we're seeing it almost in all industries today. There is some level of security, some obviously being higher based on the instruments that you're, you're, you're rendering. But in today's world, security is required, whether you're, you're, you're servicing the financial services firm or the retail side of the business, as people's information, as their documents are critical, and there is privacy information on those documents, whether it's a name and address or it's uh, social security numbers or routing numbers for checks, we're seeing that this is growing larger and larger. I would say anything that's rendering money or have, is, has account, is account laden, the levels of security are at a higher level. But we are seeing that push down in our environment even to, either to some rudimentary areas of document rendering. Does that kind of answer that, Barb? Sure. Now, one other quick question. You use the term layered best practices. And one of our participants asked if you could explain what layered best practices is. I'll do my best. Layered best practices are multi, uh, multi-tiered security uh, measures on the logical side, meaning, let's say, multiple firewalls, uh, multiple zones within your network, segmenting of your network, intrusion detection systems running through the multiple zones of your network to ensure if there is, uh, let's say, an intrusion, that it's trapped in, multi in at one zone and that one device cannot be attacked in singular. So if you get through one, you have more layers to go through to actually get to the core network itself. Uh, this causes, uh, from a security standpoint, it, it tends to push people away because the, long, the deeper the layers, the, the more often they're going to get trapped and caught in when they do try to penetrate your systems, if they do. Does, does that kind of explain that? Yep, sure does. So continuing on on the phys physical side, uh, one, one requirement that is critical is restricted zones for employees so that Access is limited to the function and role of the employee, uh, picture-based ID cards, uh, video monitoring on all accesses, and we're seeing today a minimum of 90 days uh, stored video on our servers for review. And of course, you're required to alarm, be alarmed for fire, smoke, and access. And then regular, at least quarterly training of employees based on security and confidentiality procedures. Uh, it, it is important that your employee base not only understand these procedures and processes that you're writing, and but then adopting that they're performing them. So jump to the next slide. Yep, yeah, got it. Going into check data processing, some of the keys around that uh, data, data file validation is critical. So when we receive the data, we're breaking apart that we're validating. Uh, the number of records, payments, the amounts of dollars received, uh, validation of check payment dates, beginning and ending check numbers in the transmission received from the institution. If any one of these checkpoints have, fail have a failure, the, the job is abended and sent back to the customer for retransmission, meaning that there is an issue and that has to be examined. Once passed through those initial data validation points, the systems will generate check images all the processing control metrics throughout the facility are generated, the number of impressions, sheets, checks, envelopes are going to be generated, and all the various different control points that we have from a quality control perspective are spit into our system and our, our operation for, for the managers to review as well as the operators as they're going through them. We generate images for the checks for customers to review through a web portal, which we'll show you briefly in a few seconds. We void those with a watermark through them. We've also ma we're, uh, masking any routing numbers, signatures, those type of elements, which are items that can be lifted off a document for reproduction or fraud, are really unnecessary for a review of the document. Typically review by an institution is for check date, the amount, and the payees. The other items are typically loaded into the system and stored and don't change on a regular basis. When we receive approval through our web systems, they are, the, the images are generated in a live environment 
queued and moved to the various different production output zones. Jumping to the next slide, uh, we do provide customers have client portals that they can actually come in. They can open up their particular batch run, review the documents that have been processed, suppress individual documents, reject the entire shipment or, of data, or approve it and move it on to the next stage. John, I do have a quick question, and, and I'm not totally clear that I understand the question, so I'm going to ask you, and if you can answer, great. If you can't, that's okay, too. Sure. But the question came in, and it says, for in the field document verification, without the availability of tools or hardware, what method of document security will perform better than a, a void panograph? What will have been a void panograph? The void panograph that we're generating here is an electronic void panograph. Okay. I, I don't know. Uh, it, it's actually not a paper panograph that's being generated on the document itself. We are, gen we are moving that through various different portions of the check, which would make it difficult to lift the type from an electronic representation, as well as all of the masking of the control points or the, the routing number and the signatures. I don't know if that answers the question because I wasn't. Okay, I'm, I'm not, I, I think you've got it. Now, one other quick question that came in for you. Are you finding that um, being SAS 70 certified or Sarbanes-Oxley compliant is a requirement of most customers who require check printing? It, it is. If you're not SAS 70 or SASE uh, 370, I forget what the exact number is. It is. It is. You have to be following the standards and the procedures. Uh, so from a from a data side, your, so maybe your facility and some of the other items in your facility may not meet the requirements from a business continuity perspective, but if from a security standpoint, if you're not following those guidelines of that process, then it, you will have a tough time to enter into that space. Okay, great, thanks. Moving past the portal, the portal is a convenience method for which customers can actually review their, their documents, their their checks and they can approve them and move them in. What this has eliminated is the need for, number one, moving documents through email uh, as attachments, which is, is, is a risk point, actually generating physical samples of printed samples with void through them, which again is also a risk point. Uh, and, and this makes it very seamless for the customers to control that process through a remote or an outsourced provider. Once we get to the check imaging status, uh, Barbara jumped the slide, print, full, print files are spooled directly into the, uh, the printers, this is the OSE 6160s, um, so that when the check actually prints, it can't be rerun, it's running through a, a natural spool process. Check stock, as Barb had mentioned earlier, uh, is controlled with individual numbers on the back, not the actual check number, stock numbers, so every piece of paper that's extracted from the secure staging area for check documents, check stock, is recorded on an outbound basis, what's been imaged onto it, any destruction or documents that are, are uh, destroyed in the process are also recorded and saved, moved back into the storage area with the overage or the excess print that wasn't, the stock that wasn't printed and maintained. So there's a one-to-one -one correlation with the stock that's unused stock that was destroyed, and the stock that was actually rendered um, for the customer. Once the checks are actually printed, they're loaded into locked cages. Locked cages are moved to secure staging areas waiting for the assembly or the uh, fulfillment stages. Any destroyed checks that have been put into the secure staging area uh, that have been signed off by the customer on, during a regular order process are then moved into lock bins that are shredded on site. Once we complete the actual imaging process, the checks are moved with the locked secured bins and moved to a mailing area. They're matched up to their paperwork. Cages are unlocked by management only, can't be opened by operators. They're inserted with a 309 barcode on the side where the actual packaging information, not an account number, is stored and tracked through the system. All the packages are reconciled and validated to ensure that the integrity of what went into the inserter was what came out on the other side, trayed and sorted and moved directly onto U.S. Postal trucks. So there isn't any 
Once it comes off the inserter, it's into the U.S. Postal Service system. One of the other components is we offer customers often some of these checks may not have validated that the funds have been posted to the check to the accounts. So in that particular case, checks will be inserted, put back into locked cages, and moved to a secure staging area until the funds have been validated from the customer and posted to their account, at which time an electronic notification is provided, which feeds back into our systems, thereby releasing that check run to be put into the postal system. If we jump to the next slide, kind of give you an overview of a check processing workflow that I just described, where the check files flow in, the various different stages that you go through an, appro an approval state status. To include, we have also provided customers the ability to do on-statement messaging directly onto check remittance portions of the check so that additional documents do not have to be accompanied with the check itself, therefore creating any kind of paper workflow where pieces of paper may be moving around or, or may get misplaced in an actual production cycle. All documents are imaged directly into that run, and actually within the actual production run, document one to document two is synced through the intelligent inserter to know if there is a break in the sequence, a manager is, a manager is notified, that there has been a stoppage or a break in the sequence and somebody is examining that process. Showing the various different workflows from the web interaction, if the job is abended or checks are asked to be destroyed, customers flowing that all the way out to the post office. We give the customers three points of approval process so that they're able to control this workflow directly from their desktop all the way out, out the door. This, is, this provides a secure loop, so again, minimizing moving things through email um, and various different other control points with, that do put risk around a process within an organization. Jumping to the next slide. Before I let, before I let you off the hook there, okay. um, I, we have two questions for you. One is, sure. what type of, you mentioned on-statement state, on messaging. What types of things are customers doing of yours in terms of on-statement messaging? Uh, you know, we hear a lot about trans promo and those kinds of things, but what types of on-statement messaging would apply here, John? What, what they're typically doing, so take dividend checks as a rule, as, as, a, as a process. It may be a last-minute information, last information that the uh, reporter is, wants to put onto the document itself. Uh, meaning that uh, we're paying dividends through the 31st of this month or something of that that may not have made it into the processing check run. It could also be, uh, a, you know, visit our website and enroll for uh, ACS, ACH wire transfer, eliminate the need for checks. That type of messaging is going on to the document. It's not typically a marketing document because we see that it's not so easy in, that type, in this type of a, a document to incorporate marketing messages because you're so typically be, dealing with it would be, be say that it would be trans, it would be trans informational to so be information for the client on the check that's right so it's information around the client on the check and what we've seen is the reason that it, it, it's been so well adopted is they they were typically additional inserts or buck slips that were being stuck in the envelope and it, it tied up an entire process while the buck slip was being generated or matching up particular buck slips to particular check runs. By doing this, it images directly on the check. Also, if we're doing a, big, a large check run from multiple companies, uh, it allows that to go in one stream, bringing the postage discount down. Um, Great. Because each and image it, is individually generated. And I, before you get to recommendations, I have one additional question for you. And I'm going to let you respond to this. So I, I have an answer to it, but is the security print using a digital device as secure as offset printing? Is it as secure as offset printing? I, yeah. I guess it's really, you have to look at the instrument of what you're producing. Uh, from a check perspective, the next wave of check imaging will be the high-speed inkjet presses, whether the, the OSE or the various different companies that are offering it, because we can actually generate the pantograph, the, the stock controls can get eliminated, we can do all of those controls right in line on the, on the actual printer itself, eliminating that additional step to say, hey, I've got stock that I have to track. 
Yeah. Uh, I would almost say that we have the ability with the digital environment to generate more controls, more processes beyond what an offset press can do, okay. whether that be uh, ultraviolet uh, inks that we can use, uh, and they can vary. Uh, we can change the algorithms on those type of security measures quickly, whereas in an offset environment, we may not be able to do that. Great answer. Thanks, John. I'll let you get to your recommendations here. So, I, I mean, from a final perspective, uh, se secure practices, both logical and physical, are critical. I, I think we need to, you have to adapt security, uh, both on the data side as well as the physical side. Automated processing environments alleviate a lot of touch points. Only they create an automated workflow, but they also reduce the risk in processing, no processing those and remove people from the process. Automated proofing reduces paper, email, areas where there is risk in pushing an image out and allowing people to look at or letting somebody grab that image and do something with it. Closed loop queuing so that people aren't moving files around through various different servers. It's going directly from that automated process into a print queue being released by the operator or the manager and produced and then removed from that printer. Microscanning, validating check densities is critical. We scan those checks every 100 or so images to ensure that the density is going to be good through the banks, required positioning. Secure staging areas is very important to make sure that things are separated and secure. Multiple points of validation to make sure the imaging and the inserting are correct. Package tracking. Automated regeneration procedures so that you're able, easily able to regenerate those images and account for each regenerated image. And then managing, having complete management operator and employee training of your security practices will only enhance your process. Well, John, that was tremendous insight. I'm sure we'll have some more questions. Please don't be bashful or keying those in. Uh, but that was great insight, John. Thank you. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to um, Mike Lambert uh, from CEPAS. And Mike's going to talk to you about trends in, in secure printing. All right. Thank you, Bob, for the introduction. And there we go. So just a little bit about CFAS Innovation. We've actually been around for uh, about 20 years or so. We started back actually in the 80s as a consulting firm, and we actually built uh, software tools to, to do composition and to build an ADF for British Telecom back in the 80s, and then uh, productionized and started marketing our solutions in, in about 1991. We are owned by DACA Post, which is the French government, the French postal system, and you might think that be odd that the post office uh, would own a software company, but they actually own several software companies as the European postal system is trying to evolve to a more service bureau model, moreover what we do here in the States. So their plan is to take in people's uh, raw data, create images, or take in print-ready files and process them in remote locations across the country so they can remove some of the infrastructure costs to truck, fly, and truck the mail in between. Of course, they would get a fee for doing that service, but offer much deeper discounts on postal rates uh, in the meantime. And to keep up with the trends in the industry for electronic presentment, et cetera, uh, they have, we have sister companies in DACA Post that do uh, email delivery and network and security and all of the other uh, digital and IT solutions necessary to do both physical and electronic distribution. So in order to accommodate the, all those types of services, you, you need to be able to create images from raw data using composition tools, take in people's print-ready files and amend them with the necessary production control marks to uh, be able to process in these facilities, and number three, uh, be able to take large chunks of work and split them apart and process them in remote facilities, but still keep track from uh, an integrity standpoint and service level tracking and billing standpoint, uh, despite that these things might be split across multiple facilities. So that's really what we do at CFAS. We, that's what we offer is the open print 
software solution. So subsequently, we get to see a lot of different aspects from a digital side, uh, how people address the secure printing um, issues that they have to deal with. So a little bit about myself. I'm uh, um, Vice President of Sales for CFAS. I'm responsible for managing uh, the direct sales in the U.S. and our partner relationships and basically guide the product development uh, on where we see we need to uh, attack new markets, et cetera. Uh, previous to this, I was an enterprise technology architect at Cigna Healthcare for about 25 years, planning the long-term infrastructure and service planning for uh, print-on-demand, print-to-mail, imaging, uh, composition services, all the things necessary to create customer communications. In, in doing so, that involved check processing, EOBs, EOPs, and all the other different types of policy and secure documents that uh, a healthcare provider may, may produce. So I think that my particular background and skill set really uh, came uh, to uh, the ability to link technology to these business objectives and really take a focus on what we needed to do from a corporate standpoint and then apply that to what are the technologies and trends in the industry that are facilitating these types of services. And then how do you get from point A to point B? And the ability to create tactical migration strategies to leverage what I have today, but build a strategic path and kind of evolve uh, to what I need to be tomorrow. So just some, some basic observations of where we see today's leading companies going. You know, everybody's increasingly being challenged with more privacy and compliance uh, regulations. Um, PCI, HIPAA, SOX, it's really been with the customers that we've dealt with in the past, I would say, 18 to 24 months, the restrictions have uh, greatly increased, and I would say that a good 70% of the contracts we have uh, in flight today have all been rewritten recently to add in much more stringent uh, requirements around our employees and facilities and care needed to process secure data. So we see that this, this whole approach needs to be both physical and electronic, so taking the proper steps to secure the data and, and the transferring of the data, uh, insert the necessary control information and indexing. Basically, each transaction now has to have an identity, whereas before we would process at a job level and make sure that 100 pieces went in and 100 pieces came out, that's no longer acceptable. Now we have to provide transaction level visibility and accountability as we process these things so that it's the right 100 transactions in and out of the, in and out of the process. So um, intelligent devices and camera systems to securely process this is now becoming more prevalent. And automation and workflow systems to trigger, track, and audit this across the multiple steps of the production process. So from our perspective, the key trend that we see is you have to manage your digital assets to better leverage the phys physical assets. So if you can have intelligent inserting and you can have cameras on your folders and cutters and printers, et cetera, but if you don't have the right uh, indexing and control marks on the data to begin with, then the physical infrastructure isn't going to provide uh, the necessary security that you're looking for. So you have to embed the proper controls, either via the composition or post-composition process, and in intelligent indexing and integrity marks on each document and transaction, and then record that information uh, through the whole process. Another trend we see is using either composition or post-composition to put the dynamic insertion of overlays and secure backgrounds. So as you were talking about before, adding watermarks, uh, the digital void panograms and, and digital verification grids, 
uh, so that people can't photocopy and that when somebody sees an original check, it has the right markings on it so it's easily identifiable. But to the uh, question that was posed earlier, how do we do this if we have a manual uh, point of sale or something uh, where somebody is taking the document in from a remote source and doesn't have the ability to uh, look at a watermark or, or things of that nature, how do I validate that that document is real? Um, indexing, creating these tracking files and at least having a correspondence to a name and an address block with an account number uh, something to link that together. Uh, we find other people use kind of a document fingerprint. So some instances you can't put a barcode on a document or some watermark on a document, but if I looked at four or five different areas of a document and I captured whatever information was in that area and I used that to make that unique, maybe an approach like that might be able to help you step down the path of securing your documents without having the necessary infrastructure to do it day one. And that's what I was referring to with kind of, um, you know, practical migration strategies to get from point A to point B. That's the MacGyver method. <laughs> so um, also if you can manage your digital assets, you can start right-sizing your jobs and processing them for postal efficiency. We see a lot of people merging their check and non-check work these days uh, for postal efficiency because now we can do, you know, uh, micro and color printing together and use a common stock with dynamic perfing machines and other types of techniques so that you can start to do better householding and postal sortation and merge your EOBs and EOPs together, for example, uh, so you can get more efficiency from your high-speed devices and, and better postage. Hey, Michael, quick sure. question. Have you gotten any input when you start looking at blending those uh, documents, the kinds of postal savings that people have been able to incur? Well, uh, one example from a, a Blue Cross Blue Shield um, a customer of ours, they through householding, they are saving uh, about 120,000 a month in in postage. Okay. Um, right. Where my past at at Cigna, I think it was uh, a couple of million. <laughs> yeah. But substantial savings if you're if you're if you're getting this right. Right. And then you know if you think about it, if you could, you know, process your non-check statements and then the last page becomes the check and you can dynamically put the overlay on it with the, with the digital pantogram and the void mark on it uh, dynamically as an overlay and then use either perforated stock or cut the stock uh, in, a, in a finishing process. Uh, that would greatly reduce the, the issues of doing the, um, um, you know, trying to merge two separate print jobs at insertion time uh, to facilitate the same thing. Great, thanks. So the regulatory challenges, again, the privacy challenges are ever increasing and it's no longer restricted to, you know, floor security of making sure you use lock boxes and caging up the stock and signing it out and the manual control sheets to audit the beginning and ending click number on the printer, et cetera. <laughs> These are, have ever expanded to securing the entire environment. So a lot of our service bureau customers especially um, are now asking how they can take their whole environment and make it PCI compliant. So the PCI, the payment card industry security standards, um, uh, you know, from the FTP or the secure FTP process right down to um, you know, the, the server that hooks up to the post office all have to be behind the firewall and, and, and secure data transfer in between. And once the data is gone, those data, the, the servers themselves have to have scrubbers run against them to make sure that the images of the, uh, the files are completely removed from the servers. Um, and then the compliance reporting itself, so this is again where 
we have to start to think in terms of transaction level details. So it's no longer that job, check job number 75 ran and 700 pages came out. It's check job number 75 ran and these 700 individual transactions came out uh, with a complete history of the time that the file hit your server to the time it went through the three or four physical processes and then validated that it made it out the door or through electronic distribution. So with regard to the application with, from a challenge standpoint, um, most of the people, the Fortune 500 companies that John had mentioned are the same uh, folks that we deal with as well, and the, the number of legacy applications is, uh, you know, it's, it's almost insurmountable. So, um, you know, to go and to put these controls into the various secure document applications, even if it took three months and I had 50 of them, that's 1,500 months of programming time. So you can have all of the hardware lined up, but if the applications aren't, <laughs> if you don't put the proper controls into the digital assets, you cannot leverage the physical assets put in place to secure them. So this remains a problem where um, a lot of manual processes are still in place and the lines of businesses who own those applications are very slow to update that. But the reality is they put the operations and the service providers at risk because, you know, they've put the proper physical controls in, but the applications are not um, still not up to date to leverage them. So moving along here. From an environment standpoint, again, the intelligence, smart devices to track at the transaction level, camera systems to compensate for less intelligent devices, additional camera systems to track actual content on these documents. I mean, tracking barcodes are one thing, maybe matching the amount to the address block or something is, is where we see uh, uh, some people going to make sure that uh, the content matches the recipient. Um, and you need tracking systems to collect and report on these types of results. So the printing infrastructure has to deliver the data somewhere and the inserting and the reprinting and the finishing or whatever manual processes happen in between. In order to have a full secure infrastructure, this all has to be reported up to some workflow automation or collection system. Um, and that's where we see uh, people trending again in the last 18 to 24 months, a lot of interest in workflow automation to trigger track and audit these processes. And then site management capabilities to collect all of the data from the various components so that you can do a, a centralized reporting across all of the services. And that's from the time that the file hits the queue till the time that you send it out the door or present it online. So some of the controls we see, the old check registers, uh, making sure that those are sent to the bank, et cetera, when the processing is complete. Itemized production control reports, again, giving document level and transaction level details. Still using device logs system logs for when the programs are processing, and then facility logs when people are actually employees are logging in and logging out and who was in the facility at the time that the things were processing because if things go missing, they have to be able to start to uh, pinpoint who was, who was actually physically in the building when that material uh, disappeared. So, Mike, I've got a quick question for you. Just sure. if somebody asked a question, and, and you talk about legacy application and the complexities of different lines of business. In today's market, do you think that the obstacle is technology, or is it really um, the legacy side of the market? What's the biggest slowdown today? It's uh, resources. Resources. <laughs> it's IT resources in the business because really um, what ends up happening is the business turns over the, the, 
the production of the check or the secure document to the operations, and they basically kind of wiped their hands of it. And coming from an operations perspective, and I'm sure a lot of people on the phone will, will uh, <laughs> concur, you know, asking them to add a barcode or change uh, data uh, takes a small lifetime. And it's not that they're not attentive, it's just they have other business priorities and at times um, this isn't their highest priority. So, If, if somebody I'm, asked me to define legacy, could you just take a second to define how you describe legacy apps? Um, just applications that are in production today. So um, um, some applications uh, in companies were created, say, in the last couple of years and have the appropriate production control marks and security measures put into them. And then what I term legacy is the applications, the, the, the land of the lost toys applications that uh, nobody has actually touched the code in 20 years. Yeah. And okay. uh, those applications, um, operations struggle to automate and to leverage the latest technology because they don't own them. The business owns them. And, and that's where we see the, the lag. Great, yeah. thanks. Yep. So from uh, trends, we see uh, a lot of merging of non-check and check applications because there's more use of color prevalent and the ability to electronically insert these uh, uh, these pantographs and uh, and grids on it to secure things and not use pre-printed stock. Uh, and then with the intelligent cutting and perforation capabilities, you can always uh, uh, create a check out of a, a blank piece of paper uh, in stream. Um, we see that people uh, address these issues and kind of quickly put these security measures in place using post-composition tools. Again, going back to the lines of businesses, and if I had 50 applications, and even if it took a month to fix each one, would be 50 months before you could leverage, fully leverage all your devices you have out on the floor. So from an operation standpoint, a nice alternative is to just take the data out of the uh, incoming uh, uh, print file, massage it on the fly, and put the necessary controls so you can leverage the devices on the floor. Um, more secure environments, people are moving, again, their FTP servers, the print servers, intelligent inserting servers. These are all now being behind the firewall in these PCI compliant um, uh, environments. And uh, again, um, online presentment, a lot of document encryption, uh, things of that nature, and huge increase in facilities and employees security of white rooms to process the data and PCs without USB ports and no cameras on your phone and employees with background checks and, and things of that nature are all, these are all written into a, a lot of the contracts I see to do business with folks these days. And the evolution of the enterprise ADF, which is this intelligent tracking from end to end. It used to be called the automated document factory, the ADF. Now it's evolved to the enterprise ADF, which is a little bit outside the boundaries of um, the physical production environment and now has to cover the IT environment. And these environments have to process at a transaction level, not the job level, a transaction level. So here's a, <laughs> an example of raw data and print file information coming into a secure landing zone and workflow automation triggering composition or post-composition to format the data and get it prepared for the operations. And then basically monitoring and reporting on the physical aspects and putting that information in a central repository to be um, used for compliance reporting or to be given back to business customers or customer service agents. So that's kind of the, the end of, of my, uh, my, uh, my rant here. And just to uh, summarize that um, 
we at CFAS have uh, a couple of products, uh, designer and producer, that kind of facilitate the ability to either create brand new documents using composition or to repurpose print streams using post-composition to implement the security measures. And we have a, an enterprise ADF architecture that can plug into people's print servers and intelligent inserting environments and things of that nature and kind of watch the end-to-end -end production process at a transaction level. So. Well, well, thank you very, very much, Mike. And I'm going to just tell everybody we've got a few minutes for Q&A. If you haven't submitted a question, please do so. Um, if you've got one, um, I'm going to just wrap up with a couple of, of recommendations and conclusions. And first, I want to thank both both uh, John and Mike for uh, valuable information. But I think the big component that everybody needs to look at is we really are dealing with a $725 billion plus problem. And service providers of all types can have a major impact in terms of um, helping clients uh, reduce fraud, counterfeiting, um, and make sure that the right person gets the right document. And the bottom line benefit is that it reduces losses and improves the bottom line results for both your organization and those that trust in you. It's going to help you if you're a service provider improve revenue because you're offering an expanded services portfolio. It's also going to help your customer base. You're protecting your clients and you're increasing overall compliance. Um, it, it's a complex process, and I think as you listen to both John and Mike, it takes an investment. And what you've got to do is take a look at the risks associated with specific documents. You need to take the time to evaluate the technologies and work process changes that are essential to meeting customer needs. And you really need to do a good job at um, that overall cost-benefit analysis. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that I think companies need to look at as they move forward in terms of um, the overall strategy for secure documents. Now, I do have one question that came in, um, and I'm going to direct this to Mike. And it says, Mike, do you use server virtualization or physical services? I ask both John and Mike, or do you recommend server virtualization or physical services? And I'll start with John. John, uh, any comments on server virtualization or physical service servers? Uh, we use uh, server virtualization uh, for the simple fact that you, from a redundancy, a, a testing environment, and uh, creating platforms where you can roll them out quickly, um, it, it seems to work very well. Uh, so I, I see that as the, as the driving trend, and the answer is yes, server virtualization. Mike, yep. Okay, and Mike, would... any comments? No, nope, I would concur. Um, uh, virtual server environments handles all the forward recovery, disaster recovery, scalability, and uh, uh, security. So that's the, that's what we've seen in the trend in the last, say, 18 months has been more uh, virtual machine environments. Yeah, I mean, you can basically replicate an environment inside of 15 minutes that would take you hours or days if you're, you're moving uh, from a virtualized environment. Okay, and I have one last quick question, and then we'll we'll wrap up. But um, Mike, you made a comment about logging in and out of the building and knowing who's in the in a building. And the question that came back is, what about biometric access control systems? Any comments on that? Well, um, I mean, for for our perspective, uh, we have you know secure IDs and. Uh, so employees uh, have access and you have to use a, a keypad to get in. Um, but we don't necessarily run a production floor, so I wouldn't yeah. have the same insight that maybe John would have. John, any comments on biometric controls? Uh, I mean, we have them at various different points. Uh, it, it's fine, uh, but you, to Mike's point, you need to keep logs of who's accessing what area at what time. And actually, the, the, using the cards, and uh, they seem to work better and they track better because, you know, it, I haven't seen machines, but, you know, that have biometric start points on the machines. It's more, uh, you know, they have, we have readers or monitors by those machines where they can log their time and log what they're doing on that particular job. Okay. 
Well, guys, I would really like to thank you for your time today. Um, great insight in terms of um, how to make documents more secure. Thanks again, and I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today and your participation. Have a great rest of the day. Take care.